All right. Um, I, can you hear me okay? I switched yes. to a different mic. so We can hear you good. Sure. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the reasons why I wanted to showcase uh, some of the work that we've done within the county around this is that sometimes GIS is, is relegated. Um, you know, we talked about small level infrastructure projects or, you know, support projects. And to me that what I, the reason why I wanted to focus on what this does is that this um, is a big deal, how GIS actually enabled a massive amount of funding that should actually change the way that we handle water within the county of Los Angeles. So um, I'll go ahead and give a little bit, bit of background. Um, the LA County flood control system, for those of you who may or may not know this, the LA River used to actually exit out by Santa Monica Bay. But back in the early 1900s, a huge flood actually switched that, that course of the river. So now it and, uh, exits out by Long Beach. Well, that caused a lot of damage. And so the LA County flood control system was really designed to move water uh, from the mountains to the ocean as quickly as possible. However, um, you know, that's changing because obviously there's issues around, around water pollution and also for um, collecting water for reuse. So I took this picture actually this morning. Uh, if you ever come into the Public Works headquarters, you should take a look at this. Um, we now track uh, the stormwater capture that we do every single year. So this is kind of interesting. This is a new model for the way that we handle stormwater. Uh, we don't try to get rid of it. We actually try to use it. So recharge aquifers. Uh, reducing costs and the energy needed to import water from very, very far away. So <clears throat> how do we pay for these potential uh, upgrades to the county's infrastructure to both, uh, you know, make drinking water clean and more local? Um, well, the idea was that water runoff uh, comes from surfaces that do not absorb water. So these are impermeable surfaces. So the idea basically is to assess property owners' attacks based upon how much water from their property is going into the storm drains. Obviously, if it doesn't leave their property, it's being infiltrated into the ground and therefore it recharges the aquifers uh, naturally. But if we're building infrastructure, uh, we should actually put the cost onto those properties that are actually um, putting water into the storm drain systems. So impermeable surfaces have historically been used by local jurisdictions um, to pay for these projects. But how do you calculate a permeability layer and a permeability value for each of the counties over 2.4 million parcels? So what is an impermeable surface to start with, right? So they're considered to have following characteristics, uh, buildings, roads, parking lots, brick. You know, these are basically areas of man-made soil uh, that, uh, that basically where the water runs off and is not uh, soaked into the ground. And then non-impermeable surfaces or permeable surfaces uh, are identified as vegetated areas, both natural and man-made, water bodies, wetland areas, and things like sand, bare soil, things like that. So how do you identify where those are across a jurisdiction of over 4,000 square miles? Well, historically, uh, these surfaces were determined through a statistical approximation. So, you know, you would take an aerial photograph, you do random dots, and effectively for each type of land, you would come up with a percent of permeability uh, for each type of land. So the part, the assessor actually tracks land use or um, of each of the properties. Um, and so there was an initial attempt to use this methodology to say that if a land is zoned as or is used as agricultural or as commercial, there's just 1% that's applied to that. Well, <clears throat> that approach went up to the Board of Supervisors, excuse my lights, they turn off automatically, um, and rejected because it was uh, unfair and there was a lot of resistance to it from property owners. So this method was rejected. So how do you do this potentially in a more uh, quantifiable and more accurate method? Well, the new approach that we took used data from the Los Angeles Regional Imagery Acquisition Consortium, AKA LARIAC, you've heard a lot about that. Uh, through pictometry or eagle view, through a lot of the information that we um, that we use, um, and basically the starting point back in 2015 and 16 was not to develop permeability because we didn't have this idea at first. Uh, it was to develop a land cover data set based upon the data that we are capturing in order to do one of many, many different things, tree canopy analysis, uh, potentially looking at even speciation over time. 
But the end result of this was that we ended up with a very precise and a parcel level quality set of information uh, around land cover. So the way that we did this, we started with aircraft. Um, you heard that from Brian Garcia. We captured multi-spectral or multi-band imagery. So this was four band. Uh, we added an infrared band. Um, we used LIDAR uh, for elevations to identify you know, trees and, and the elevations of, of the features on the ground. So we had this basically this core set of, of information that we could use to, to create land cover. So how do we actually go about doing this? So you use the infrared. Um, if you see the picture on the right, this is you know, a very typical um, uh, image that you see with infrared where green turns, you know, vegetation is, is red. You build um, a set of derived data sets. So NDVI is a very, is a very common one to normalize difference vegetation index. You know, use LIDAR to, to take something that's green and determine whether or not it's tree or grass, um, or if it's not green, if it's pavement or a building. So those are valuable. And then the key component was to use GIS processing. And this is where GIS becomes really critical because you can put this information together. Uh, you can do object recognition using artificial intelligence and use training algorithms to identify classes of land use and land cover. Right, this is really the key to that process. So you develop, you train the computer on how to recognize objects uh, based upon the various uh, classifications and source information. And then um, the computer spits out a set of what it thinks are different land cover uh, classifications. And then we clean them up, do quality control and go through that again. So that's really the key with land cover. So turning land cover into impermeable surfaces is the next step. So on the right side, you see the various land cover classifications that we came out with. Some of them are permeable and some of them are impermeable. So if you look at the impermeable land cover classes, those are things like buildings, roads, uh, other paved areas. Um, and the permeable land cover classes are things like tree canopy, grass and shrubs. So these are pretty consistent consistent and standard land cover classifications. But what was interesting is that we created this initially without specifically having a use case for it. But when Public Works actually realized that this was this existed, they came and asked our, our GIS team and at ISD to, de to determine and let them know whether or not we could turn that into a, a square footage of permeable or impermeable surfaces for every single parcel. And the key thing is that we actually had the, the resolution and the data that we could do that with. And the key, you know, looking forward, this is what you end up with. So as a starting point, you start with uh, a map with this type of uh, land cover. And these are, you know, you've seen these, that there are very large scale versions. So you can get land cover for the entire state of California. But historically, that data was at something like a 10 by 10 meter us, you know, cell size, we were getting this down to the five foot cell size. And that makes a huge difference when you're trying to determine things around parcels. And that's the key thing when you, you know, one of the things that's always interesting to me within the county is that when we actually start making decisions around changing policies, procedures, taxation, land development, land use, at its core, you're talking about information that impacts property values, property ownership. Therefore, your data has to be granular and accurate enough to, to be able to give you actionable intelligence at a fairly small, at a fairly large scale, which is at a parcel. So let's take a look at where this starts from. So, you know, here's a parcel in the middle. You can see there's a, a house, they've got some pavement on, on there, there's some trees around the edges. So that's what you see from imagery. <clears throat> we turn that into land cover. So you can see that there are some trees on the north side of this property on the, on the south. There's some bare soil. Um, <clears throat> we don't have any water on this property. So this is how you can do some quality checks. Um, so you can see where we have buildings, the roads are on the north and other paved surfaces. So if we go back and forth, right, you can see how that, um, that area of, of cement uh, on the left side of the property, on the on the western side of the property, shows up on this uh, on the land cover data set. Converting this to a 
permeable versus impermeable surface is actually fairly straightforward because as we identified a couple slides ago, you just pick those classifications that are permeable. So that's what this ends up looking like. So permeable versus impermeable surfaces. Now, from this point forward, the big processing component comes in, right? What is actually complex at this point is not the, not the development of the actual uh, surface or the data itself, it's processing massive numbers of points. So converting all of these individual cells that are permeable or impermeable into point files, overlaying them with parcels, counting you know, the square footage, and then doing this over 2.4 million parcels for the entire county. So be, this is actually becomes a processing and horsepower issue rather than actually conceptual. And that's where the ISD uh, Enterprise GIS team uh, put that together and de developed a data set, which for every single property in the county had a square footage of impermeable surface, right? So at that point, you can identify what the impacts will be, right? So for example, uh, certain limitations where the LA County Flood Control District um, is the is the basically the core of this uh, the, of the administration of this program. Uh, it does not include their Antelope Valley. Uh, it broke all of its uh, its the jurisdiction around this into a number based upon the um, these these regional areas based upon watersheds. Um, and so they went through and turned all of this raw data into a measure W, which went on the, um, which was approved by the board to go to an election to approve this parcel tax, which then passed uh, with about 68% of the vote uh, about three years ago. So this was, you know, this is a critical component. And this is where actually GIS has made this huge difference because the board of supervisors understood that there was a quantifiable justi justification for identifying the source of water entering our storm drain system. So they could actually put their weight behind and their political heft behind getting this ballot measure on to the, onto the uh, ballot and uh, getting it passed. What did this end up becoming? So the end, the end result was a 2.5 cent per square foot of impermeable area tax assessed to every single property that uh, with some exemptions. So government land, uh, low-income se seniors, and if you actually had done work on your property where you had actually uh, built swales or other types of, uh, of features that would reduce the square footage of the, uh, or the, reduce the water flowing into the storm drain system, there'd be a credit for that. So the crazy thing about this at the end of the day, which is that the analysis calculated about 400 square miles of impermeable area in the county. So this is the area that's shedding water into the storm drain system, and that's being flushed directly out, out to the sea. I now, know. what that ends up meaning is that it, at two and a half cents per square foot, that is resulted in an estimated $280 million in annual revenues that will be used for projects to benefit communities and take and divert that water that's coming off of that impermeable area into the storm drain system and diverting it into cleaning, you know, into uh, facilities that can clean that water and then uh, insert it into the county's aquifer so that we can actually pull that water during the summer and use it for drinking water or for uh, irrigation during the summer. So that's, that's the cre critical component that we've been able to um, identify this area, uh, quantify it, justify where that comes from, make this a reusable a re, you know, reusable process. Somebody else could have gone and done this themselves as well. Um, the, the methodology is fairly clear. So we know how we can do that. Um, and the way that this water, this funding is being allocated is basically there's three different pots of money. So there are regional programs. Uh, if you look back, those are assigned, basically half of the money is broken broken apart by each of the watershed areas. And the amount of money assigned to each watershed is based upon, I believe the area of that watershed. 40% of that tax is basically provided to cities so that they can actually implement uh, projects within their city that can help. Um, so those can be, you know, swales or 
or converting some areas that are um, highly perme impermeable into permeable areas. And 10% of the tax, it goes to the oversight of the, of the program. So the way you look at this is that, you know, I kind of look back and say, you know, this was a GIS analysis. It's a highly complex and highly interesting one. But at the same time, if you want to talk about return on investment, the fact that we had high resolution aerial photography and we had expertise and the ability to, to write policies over 10 years, that's going to generate $2.8 billion in revenue to actually capture stormwater, uh, make it available for use later. And the key thing to me is that, you know, as somebody who cares about the environment, it'll actually re reduce the amount of water that we need to import. Uh, it, it will make us more resilient in terms of climate change and we'll actually uh, make our uh, communities safer and healthier. So I think that, you know, GIS at its core is a tool, but here's an example of something I think that is really, really powerful in terms of what you can do in terms of uh, getting the public behind a concept of using the water that we actually already receive for, uh, for our purposes. So we don't need to pull it from the Colorado River or from Northern California as much as we do today. Um, so last, uh, last note, as there's a link to the Safe Clean Water Program as well as to the LARIAC program. So there's a lot of uh, powerful information available inside of uh, the LARIAC program. And can you still hear me? It looks like I'm getting a glitch. Yes? We can still hear you. Okay. Yeah. My, it looks like my-, my um, Your video, my video went, my but that's video okay. Cutout. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so hold on a second. <clears throat> Uh, so there are a couple links on the screen. Um, if you have more questions, we're ha we're happy to I'm happy to um, answer any of the questions at this point. I do want to thank Daniel Bradbury, uh, who actually generated and put the, a lot of these slides together. He couldn't actually do this presentation. I'd asked him to do it, uh, but he's uh, Daniel Bradbury from the Safe Clean Water Program. Did a lot of the the heavy lifting to actually make this available to everybody. So um, great. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. So we're going to get into our questions. We have a few questions that are in. If other people have some questions for Mark, uh, now's a good time to put them into the chat. We got a, we got about five plus minutes to go through some of these. So I'm just going to get right into these, uh, Mark. Um, here's a question from uh, Daniel. So would you say that the GIS derived information was one of the main reasons that Measure W passed? And is GIS going to be used to track progress with Measure W as it is implemented? So the way I would answer that question is that the, the, the GIS derived information wasn't the reason why Measure W passed, but what it did is it gave our board of supervisors and people that were, um, that needed to put their, their political weight behind it, the, the actual comfort to state that it was a fair um, analysis and that it, that it would basically, that they would get behind it. So as I said before, the original concept of using just land types um, was deemed unacceptable by our, by our board. And so they actually did not, they, were, they said, we're not gonna put that on the ballot, so. Right, and um, I'll, I'll say this too. It, it reminds me of what we did with Measure R, right? We were on a task force, a technical committee on Measure R, which was the parks needs assessment. And when they did the GIS analysis to justify where parks were needed, it helped that measure pass. And I think that's the way this was for Measure W. It gave the, some science and some background information that, like you said, made people feel more comfortable with getting behind that effort. Yeah, and the other, the other part of that question, which was, um, let me take a quick look, is are GIS gonna be used to track progress? So yes, we are actually starting to work with, uh, with, the, with that program to do a couple of different things. One, I think, LA City has a good model of this, is actually have a GIS map showing where all of the projects are, that are being funded through this measure are actually going to be, uh, you know, what their status was, what the capital projects are, how much money is going into them, so that the public can actually see where all this money is going and right. the impacts that, that it has. Yep, the other absolutely. thing that was actually part of this process was that if there is a GIS based application, you can find it in the safecleanwaterla.org site, where if you had a, if you wanted to challenge or question the actual values that were provided, 
there's a GIS based tool that you can actually uh, use to um, to work with the state clean water program to make sure that the that the numbers were correct. Right, and that leads right into our next question. So uh, this is from Michael. Um, he says, <laughs> you're the guy that made my taxes go up, but he's joking <laughs> because he says that the data was about 3% off on his property, only 3% off, so not too bad. How often will the county update the permeable, impermeable data for taxes? And do you think it's the next Lariac? Question mark. So absolutely, we have, there's two, we have a new statement of work that's going out. Um, that will, I expect that this next round will be actually even more accurate, Michael, um, because the, while our imagery was high resolution and our LIDAR was high resolution, we were using a NAEP infrared data source, which is National Agricultural Information Program, which was a much larger cell size. This time with, uh, we're going to use the last round of LARIAC, which was LARIAC uh, 5, I think, which is 20. 2020 data, which captured um, infrared and elevation and using elevation at a three foot gridding scale. So it's going to be more accurate and also more consistent because all of that was captured at the same time. Great. So while three percent is is acceptable, it'd be great to get it within one percent or so. Absolutely. OK, here's another one. It says, what was the accuracy? I think you just kind of got to this a little bit, but I'll, I'll put it out there anyway. What was the accuracy of the GIS to measure the buildings on the property? So, you, Nick, it's been a little while since I've been on, uh, on that. The LIDAR data, which is the primary component of that, uh, meets ASPRS class one spec or class one specifications. So I think that's within one or two feet generally. So that was the accuracy of, of using that GIS. The other data source that we did have for buildings in particular is that Lariac has also con consistently captured vector data for buildings, which is even more accurate because that's captured yeah. through st uh, stereo pairs. So yeah. that's, a, that's a highly accurate data set. Yeah, so you, that's the thing with this program, right? You take the Lariac imagery that we have, you take some good science behind it. Once we get some better infrared imagery in there, the updating process, um, and now that people are comfortable, even with not the greatest data, you put really good, really good data, timely, all timed together, and you'll have a much more accurate assessment. So that's, that's great, that's a great program. Um, Okay, last final thought. I, I don't have any other questions that are in. Well, one just came in and, and we got one more minute, so let's do it. How long does it take to process all the parcels in the county? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. There's, there's two answers to that. If you had a perfect, so the, the only way that you can do this is through automation and through scripting. So the key component here is to, is to learn your Python scripts. Um, if you have that, and you you know, and that's all working fine, um, you can probably process everything in the county in probably about a week of just pure horsepower. However, once you get that raw data, there's always the components of what are the derived sets of information that you need, and how do you uh, put that into a format that is actually easy to understand. So that probably takes a month or two at that point. So it's the yeah. the preparation of the data can take a long time. And then you have the output, which is, you know, the modeling of the final result. This modeling in, inside, usually of just pure horsepower with a 16 core machine running 24 hours a day, it can take about, a, a, you know, a, a week or two. Yeah. And that's what our friends, that was the, uh, the ISD EGIS component, right? I know they were involved with that, right. with that part of the project. Absolutely. Well, that's we're great. We're doing something similar with, the, uh, with our solar data, updating our original solar modeling. And that's a much more complex piece. And that, you know, that took about, a, that takes about a month to process. Wow. Yeah. Great. Again, it's tough. We're, we're big, right? 2.4 million parcels. So if, if we can do it here, we can do it in a lot of places. So Mark. Oh, really one thing I would say, the only yep. way you can get that done is um, ArcGIS Pro, by the way. You need to go 64-bit because ArcMap 3 point, you know, it's 32-bit, it fails. Okay, there you go. There you go. There's your tip, everybody. Well, thank you, Mark. Really appreciate it. Um, we're going to end this session. Uh, 